So let's now turn our attention to part three of this discussion about navigating the future of AI augmented software. And this time we're going to focus on how we can look at the impact of engineering of AI augmented software systems. So this is not how we develop them per se, it's about how we apply them at runtime. And that's the upper left hand quadrant here in this little quad chart where you can see that we have systems that use AI, but they're possibly built using conventional ways of programming. Now, a couple things to note. AI augmented systems are software reliance systems. There's a ton of software here that include both AI and non-AI components. Just about nothing is entirely AI at this point. That's probably a good thing. And in fact, if you take a look around, you'll see that there's, there's actually lots of different kinds of AI. At the moment, generative AI, like chatbots and large language models, have sucked the oxygen out of the room for all the other kinds of AI that was going on for decades. And a lot of people are annoyed by that, especially people who are doing the old school way of doing AI, but that's okay. It's like I had a colleague many years ago when I first became a professor in the late 1990s who was really into pen-based computing, where you would use a stylus to interact with the user interface. You can imagine his chagrin when touchscreens came out because all of a sudden nobody gave a hoot about pen-based computing for the most part. They were doing things with their finger instead. So similar kind of stuff. There's lots of other cool AI going on with things like computer vision, augmented reality, various kinds of interactions that you would have in, in industrial automation systems, robots, humanoid robots, other types of robots. And over time, I think those things will get better integrated with the generative AI that we're focusing on today. So here's an example where we use AI all the time and may not even think about it because it's just such a part of our everyday life. So socio or societal scale infotainment systems, which are also sometimes referred to as socio-technical systems. All the social media stuff that we interact with. There's actually a whole discussion about this in our national agenda study that you might want to take a look at because it's very interesting in its own right, but we're not going to park there for long. So what's a great example of this? YouTube. YouTube is a multimedia content delivery platform that uses AI for recommendations, what videos you should watch, captioning, how it captions the videos, moderation, trying to remove content that might not conform to community guidelines, analysis, trying to give people like creators like myself feedback on what people like and what they don't, advertising, deciding what ads to place is based on all kinds of analysis of your browsing behavior and your shopping behavior and all kinds of other things that Google collects about you and so on and so forth. So great example of a system that is an AI augmented system in its operation. Other examples, which are not quite as common, but are becoming more common, would be mission critical systems. So self-driving cars. A mission critical system is typically where the right information delivered too late becomes the wrong information. So if you have a self-driving car and it's trying to differentiate between, say, a truck that's painted white and the sky, if it figures it out after you run into the truck, maybe that didn't really help you. So these are systems where you really have to be very concerned with quality attributes. There's a bunch of examples that are starting to emerge of people trying to apply generative AI in the context of these systems. One is which is called the Palantir AI platform, AIP, which applies generative AI models to support decision-making processes of soldiers and units who are being deployed in a into harm's way to try to help them carry out their mission as smoothly and safely as possible. So there's a really cool video you should watch if you want to learn more about that. There's another product by a company called Scale, it's called Donovan, not quite sure why it's called Donovan. Donovan was the name of a, of a performer in the, in the 60s who was friends with the Beatles. And what this does is it ingests and analyzes both structured and unstructured data in order to help analysts understand, plan, and act rapidly in minutes instead of weeks. And then there's also some really cool video, which you can watch here, where they are tracking a container ship that's going through some part of the world, think North Korea, and it's emitting some radioactive signals, and they want to be able to then target and cue certain assets to take a closer look to see whether it's carrying nuclear weapons or whatever. Also very interesting. More generally, if you take a look around, all the stuff that's coming in the future war fighting conops, concept of operations, all these intelligent digital capabilities for combining piloted aircraft with remotely controlled aircraft with semi-autonomous aircraft or onboard aircraft missions. All of this stuff is based on AI, computer vision, autonomy, decision making, and so on and so forth. And it's really quite fascinating and a little scary in, in some ways to see what's happening in this space. And you don't have to look very far as we'll see in a second to see where this stuff is being applied already. AI augmented systems have certain characteristics that are very different from classical systems built that don't use AI. My 
friend and colleague Ipe Koskaya from the Software Engineering Institute has written a nice article that you might want to take a look at that talks about some of these differences. And I'll paraphrase a few of them here. Probably the most important thing to remember is AI-based systems are often, by design, intentionally non-deterministic. And this makes a lot of sense if you're trying to be a chatbot. Again, if you ask a person a question and they give you an answer and then you ask them the same question, chances are they just won't give you the same answer. They'll try to explain it in a different way because probably you didn't understand the answer before. And that's the way that chatbots like ChatGPT and Claude work. However, in some environments, you don't want non-deterministic answers. If you're trying to track a bunch of incoming missiles or kamikaze drones coming at your ship, you probably would like to have it give you back a deterministic answer very quickly that will be correct rather than saying, oh, well, I think it might be good to do this or that. That probably wouldn't be good. And you don't have to look very far in today's world to see where this is a very important issue. Something else that is often different in AI augmented systems is this concept of emergent behavior, which is a very, very interesting concept. And basically what it says is that complex patterns can arise spontaneously from the interaction of simpler elements or components in the system. And this is where you get some really cool results with things like ChatGPT when you give it context and that it's never been trained on and then ask it questions. It can do a very remarkable job of making sense out of stuff it's never seen before. That in some sense is an emergent property. I asked, uh, I asked ChatGPT to generate me an image of emergent properties and that's what it generated. And I said, well, why the heck is that? an image of emergent properties. I thought it was a really cool image, by the way, but I'm like, why? And it said complexity from simple rules, unpredictability, nonlinearity, self-organization, interconnectedness. And I'm like, ah, that's pretty cool. I just like the fact it looks very colorful and psychedelic, but it's also showing something else that's interesting. Naturally, this emergent behavior provides all kinds of wonderful fodder for dystopian science fiction movies and books. So. Of course, the classic example is Skynet from the Terminator series. You can go back a bit before then and see HAL from 2001 Space Odyssey. By the way, little trivia for you, HAL, H-A-L, was a pun on IBM. So it's basically IBM minus minus. So HAL is, is IBM minus minus. That, that was apparently intentional by the author, Arthur C. Clarke. Another thing that AI augmented systems have that is a bit different from traditional systems is extreme dependency on data. So the quality, the quantity, the depth of the data determines how well the AI algorithms and the AI applications are going to perform. So as you might expect, if you give it crummy data, the output is likely to be crummy. Although I will say ChatGPT always surprises me. I do a lot of stuff where I'm talking to ChatGPT as my coding buddy, and sometimes I'll cut and paste something or I'll misspell something and I'll ask it to analyze a piece of code. And somehow miraculously, it can often figure out what I was asking even when I made a few mistakes or typos in what I gave it as input, which I find absolutely fascinating. And once again, is this indication that it's not just regurgitating stuff it already knows. So one of the consequences of this is that testing of data has become as important as testing of code, but there's much less known, much less literature, much less research on how to test data on emerging fields. So if you want a good PhD topic in computer science or in AI or data science, that would probably be a good one to focus on. Something else that's super important is designing these systems to be explainable and fair. So one of the big challenges in the AI systems is it's often very hard to find out where specifically it came up with the answer it gave you. Uh, for example, if you want to figure out where in ChatGPT it knows how to do conjugation of verbs with subjects or putting plurals in the right place, and versus a, uh, for example, good luck finding where it does that. It's massed in some gigantic neural network and Bayesian probability statistical uh, probability graph somewhere. So finding out why things are doing what they're doing is very difficult. What we would want to be able to do, especially if we're trying to use these systems in a mission critical context, is we really want to be able to show traceability from the recommendations it gives us. We want to know what are the mission goals? Why did it come up with this recommendation based on the mission goals? What are the resources? What's the evidence? What are the rules of engagement? What are the policies and so on? And tools are getting better at this. And if you watch this video, it'll show you some examples of how they do that, but it still is a work in progress. And a lot of improvements need to be done here in order to make people believe that these systems are trustworthy because they need to be able to provide the rationale for what they're doing. And of course, there's also a lot of focus on so-called ethical artificial intelligence or responsible artificial intelligence. And in fact, there's a whole guideline from these that the Department of Defense have put out about responsible, reliable, equitable, governable, traceable, and so on. Uh, it's interesting to notice, I guess reliability is probably where this comes in, but we also want these systems to be useful. So I remember
remember I took a course one time from a software safety, a famous software safety researcher who told us about some work that was done with the United States Navy. And the goal was to build safe torpedo. And what the torpedo did when it was built to be safe is when it was shot out of the tube, it, it sunk to the ocean floor and sat there. So it was very safe. Nobody got hurt, but it missed the point of why we had a torpedo. So we want to make sure that things are responsible and reliable and so on. But we also want to make sure that they do the mission. They're, they're suitable, they're effective. The R&D challenges trying to make augmented software work are, are vast. There's a lot of things that are hard here. We're just beginning to scratch the surface of how we should build systems that use artificial intelligence, how we should integrate them into safety critical systems. This is still quite a work in progress. There's some articles here from some of my colleagues at the SEI that talk about this stuff. So you might want to take a look at some of those. What I'll leave you with here, and we'll go on and talk about a few other things as we wrap up, is a, a famous, a paraphrase of a famous quote from the movie the Graduate, which was a film back in the 60s that starred Dustin Hoffman. And there's a famous line in there where someone comes up to him after he graduates and says, I just have one word to say to you, plastics. So, and of course that's supposed to be profound and, and he realizes it means sort of selling his soul to be artificial and so on. My take on that is the two words I want you to remember for the future, if you really wanna make a killing in a long-term career investment, assured AI. That is going to be the thing. It's right up there with cybersecurity. We will never not need cybersecurity. We will never not need assured AI. Those are going to be two very important things. So how are we going to address all this stuff and why should we try to address these kinds of things? Well, first of all, for certain environments, especially the Department of Defense, getting it right is not really an option. Sort of paraphrasing the famous NASA quote where I think it was Ed Krantz said, failure is not an option. So there's a lot of people who are trying to use AI technologies in modern warfare. Many of them are not as concerned as the US is about trying to make sure their systems work correctly, avoid collateral damage, don't go boom at the wrong time. And again, you don't have to look very far to see many, many examples of this. People are using all kinds of stuff like kamikaze drones and everything in Ukraine and other parts of the world that are hotspots right now. Part of the goal here is to continue to focus on what we know as shift left testing, try to move the testing earlier in the life cycle so we know earlier rather than later that things aren't working and aren't going the way we want. There's a couple of different ways that AI can help with that. One is to help generate test cases or test plans from documents that are done in the early phases of a life cycle, the design documents, the requirement documents. And you can use natural language programming and natural language processing in order to analyze documents and then make sure that the tests that are generated actually test what matters. And there's some really good examples of this that I've used in some of my classes that generate test cases from comments and stuff like that. Another theme that's very important is how to simulate the behavior of the system before it's finished being developed so you can do testing earlier. And one nice way of doing this is with something called the persona pattern. You can read about that more here, where you can actually use ChatGPT to pretend like it's a system that has been compromised. And there's a wonderful talk that my colleague Jules White gives showing how you use the persona pattern pattern to have ChatGPT act as a senior security engineer, and then it pretends as if a Linux machine has been compromised and you have to learn how to debug and fix and find the vulnerability. Really cool example of pattern. Something else that you can use for AI to help augment the testing process is leveraging knowledge from previous projects or previous builds or previous versions of something in order to uh, reduce the amount of time spent testing something new. So being able to take data and analyze it, look for patterns, look for trends, continuously approve, very important. I, I asked ChatGPT to generate a diagram that demonstrated this and it came up with this. One of the things you'll find with, with uh, the AI generated art is for some bizarre reason, it doesn't know how to spell. So you can see it's got learning and other sort of random weird stuff, but uh, it was a nice image and I thought I'd keep it. Something else that's important in systems that are using AI is to perform continuous quality assurance as the system is running because by its very nature, these systems are trying to be uh, deterministic. Things may change over time. There's a whole bunch of discussion about some of these issues for continuously evolving evolving systems and testing them and verifying them at scale over their life cycle that you should take a look at in the national agenda. There's some tools that are starting to come out where you can use things like ChatGPT and other tools in order to be able to do penetration testing that generates lots of different random input or more targeted input to try to break into systems in a clever way that people would find very tedious to do. But I would say that this is very much work in progress. There's all kinds of implications for safety critical real-time embedded systems where we're just beginning to scratch the surface. And this is by no means a done deal. A lot of great research in that space.
space. All right, so in our few minutes of remaining time, let's wrap up and look ahead. So using generative AI tools effectively is a step towards achieving this vision we put forth in this document from several years ago, where humans and AI work together as trustworthy collaborators. So we're already working together. The trustworthy part may be the longer term horizon. So don't throw away your brains just yet. We have to be engaged. We have to be augmented. We have to think about the results and the answers we're getting from these tools. That doesn't mean that they're not useful. It just means we have to be very careful with them. Another theme that's very important is focusing on problem solving, using these tools to do problem solving, as opposed to just doing conventional programming. That's hard. It's a hard nut to swallow, hard nut to crack, some, some kind of thing uh, for computer scientists and software engineers to, to often basically come to terms with. However, I think it's the way to go for a lot of other disciplines, including our world as well. And I have a nice video that talks about that based on some experiences here at Vanderbilt with problem solving rather than programming to do some cool stuff. I would also guess, I would also have a prognostication, high percentage shot. Soon, everybody who uses these tools will be a programmer. It's just that they won't be a programmer in the classic sense. They'll be a programmer in the problem solving sense because we will be interacting and programming these tools. And you will get lots of experience as you do projects in this class with programming with generative AI. Just for kicks, I, I asked generative AI, I asked uh, ChatGPT to generate me a picture of a bunch of dogs eating their food like this in a nice orderly way, and then generate me a picture of a bunch of dogs in a big scrum eating out of each other's bowls. Because I wanted to show the difference between concurrency in theory and in practice. And I kind of liked what it generated. Then I took a screenshot of that picture and I asked ChatGPT, why is this funny? And believe it or not, it actually knew why it was funny. It said, the, exaggerate, the exaggerated messiness of the second image emphasizes the unpredictable nature of real life situations, especially when compared to the idealized theory. It's a visual play on the age old observation that in theory, theory and practice are the same, but in practice they're not. I was like, that's pretty darn good. Most people who aren't a computer scientist would not have known why that was funny, but ChatGPT figured it out. Another great thing is we are going to be able to focus more on things that are creative without having to deal with all the mundane, low-level aspects of writing code, obscure code. We can also use these tools to help explain and summarize obscure code, which makes our lives better. So even though there's a lot left to be done, my advice to you, and which is probably easy to take because you're already doing it, is to jump in with both feet and figure out how this stuff can, can work. Just try it. And another thing to keep in mind is, if you look over the last thousand years, way before any of our time, there have been certain key innovations that have radically changed the world. The printing press, which heralded the Protestant Re Reformation, the steam engine, which brought in the Industrial Revolution, electricity, computers, and so on. I think generative AI and augmented intelligence is the next big thing. And we're very fortunate to be on the forefront of this. Taking this class is a great investment in your future, so enjoy what's going to happen. However, there are some things that we need to be wary of, and in the last minute, I'll wrap this up. Not everybody's going to get it. Not everybody wants to get it. A lot of people are going to say, this is this is too weird. I don't want to be displacing my humanity by embracing this stuff. And so we're going to end up with something that's a more uh, potentially detrimental problem than the digital divide, which is the world where we have people without access to the internet and those who have access to it. We're going to have the digital chasm where there'll be people who know how to use AI and those who don't. And the people who know AI are going to run rings around the people who don't. And that's, that's gonna cause all kinds of upheaval in our society. You probably heard the, the cliche by now, AI will not take your job, but a person who knows how to use AI better than you may. So that's the thing to think about. So the other neat thing about this, and this of course will change over time, but right now there's almost nobody on the face of the earth who has more than six to 12 months of experience with prompt engineering and generative AI and so on. So talk about a level setting. This is a chance for just anybody who's creative and wants to learn and wants to play around with stuff, who doesn't even want to be a programmer, can become well-versed in computation and how to apply computation to solve lots of very interesting real-world problems. So I think it's kind of great because very few times in your entire life will you get a chance to start at ground zero of something. If you were to go out and start looking for a job in computer science, you've got a great education at Vanderbilt if you were a CS major, but there's probably people with 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years of experience who might be more advanced than you are when you start. With this stuff, nobody else has got that experience yet. So it's a great time to get in there and, and be involved. Okay, so that is the end of this talk.